Sports on Chicago. Herbert Jones and Gluland, we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's the host of Waddle and Silbeck on ESPN 1000 and a former Bears wide receiver. Please welcome Tom Waddle to the program. Tom, it's great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing well, John. Thanks for having me and belated happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Thanks for being here. I mean, it's Black Friday morning. Everyone's shopping, and you're here, so I feel pretty special. I, John, I don't shop. Uh, you know, I have I have a <laughs> wife, four daughters. They do enough shopping on their own, so uh, I limit myself for sure. You've never done the Black Friday thing, have you? I have not, no. No, it's, it's not something that I'm interested in. Uh, if I need something, I... I ask my wife or I go online, but I don't get out in the, you know, in, in the traffic for sure. How was your Thanksgiving? It was really good. You know, my four daughters were all uh, here. I have one that lives in New York and another one that is a freshman at Boston College. So having them both come into town has been great. So uh, all four daughters were here, my wife, obviously. So the six of us last night. So it's you, you, you're, you know, speaking of Thanksgiving, you're very thankful to be able to do stuff like this. So uh, I'm very blessed and very thankful for the, the fact that my girls were in town. What have you made of the Bears so far this season? Let's talk some Bears. Uh, entertaining. I mean, hard to say a three and eight teams entertaining, but like, <laughs> you know, you know, we're used to watching an inept offense and a defense that can get after some people. But at the end of the day, we don't put enough on the scoreboard to beat most teams. And that hasn't. That hasn't been the case. Um, you know, big picture, I said this at the very beginning of the season, and, and I and I stay, you know, I, I stand firm on how I have felt all along. I, I looked at this year as a complete rebuild. Uh, you've got a new, new front office that came in, and job one for them was to actually distance themselves from the past. And I don't say that in a malicious manner, but what they wanted to do was they wanted to clean up their books financially. They wanted to kind of move on from the people that were here for an extended period of time and, and start their own thing. And, and there's pain associated with that. Um, so I, I, I didn't have any real strong expectations that this was going to be a good year for them record wise. And, and as I said, at the point as well, I said, John, you know, look, it, it's hard for, you know, it's hard for everyone to actually come to this admission because winning is everything in sports, but I really wasn't concerned with their overall record this year. My biggest concern was we saw some of their young guys make progress, specifically their quarterback. So at this point, you know, there are, there's a lot to, to continue to accomplish and there's a lot more progress to be made. But like, I don't look at the three and eight record and say, wow, this, this has been a horrible season. I, I look at the three and eight record and say, well, they've accomplished something. And most importantly, what they found out is is that Justin Fields is their guy going forward, and to me, that was the most important, you know, uh, accomplishment so far. Anyway, how have you evaluated Fields' progress from week one to today? Um, I think it's never linear. I mean, it's it's the it's it's a roller coaster playing that position. It's the toughest position in all of sports, and to play it when you don't have a ton around you uh, and you're learning, and the offense is being shifted. And you're, you know, to step back, you're learning your third offense in three years, which I don't think many people really kind of acknowledge how difficult that can be. Uh, just the terminology. And one of the things, too, is that, that I'm most impressed with. I, I always knew he was a good leader. I always knew he had a you know, tremendous skill set. His, his football IQ also came as advertised coming out of Ohio State with Ryan Day. But I would advise people to to look at the little things as well when you're evaluating him. And to think about it again, he's on his third offense in three years. He doesn't have a ton of talent around him. They've shifted kind of what they've been asking him to do over the course of the year. And you tell me how many times do they look confused coming out of the huddle? How many times are they scrambling to get a playoff? How many times do they get a delay of game penalty? There are a couple of them, but not many. And, and I think, you know, and, and maybe I'm just going to the basics too much, but for me, that that's that's been impressive from the start. Okay, so that's your baseline. So he's 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 understood what is going on. There's no chaos, which is comforting to me. And then you watch him play, and and you know, obviously, they've adjusted the offense to him, and and it's something. And you and I have talked about this a ton. It's it's the I thought it was the mortal sin of the previous regime with Mitch. 
you know, I could identify what Mitch did well and what he didn't do well early in his career. It took Matt Nagy until the final four games of Mitch's fourth system to finally put a system in place that actually catered to what Mitch did well. And, you know, I, I, I just thought that that was, you know, that was criminal in some ways. And it took, it took Luke Getze all of four or five games. And, and I know everyone was screaming, why didn't you have the design runs earlier? Well, because Jesus, it takes a while to learn your personnel. It takes a while to install an offense. It takes a while to find out what your quarterback's, you know, your quarterback's comfortable with. So I had no problem with them not getting to the design runs until week five or six after the short buy. So, um, Look, he's the most dynamic runner of the football in the league right now, with all due respect to Lamar Jackson. People want to talk about Josh Allen. Josh Allen's great, but Josh Allen's 6'6 and 240 pounds and runs a 4'8. Justin's 6'3 and 230 runs a 4'4. I mean, like, there's really no, to me, in terms of being a pure athlete, there's no comparison. Uh, the passing game, that you know, there's progress there, but at the end of the day, you know, there's more that needs to to take place in the – kind of the drop back thing. And I'm sure we can get to that later, but uh, again, the, the progress is never linear, but I think what we found out is, is he's got a skill set that can be very beneficial going forward when you mesh and you meld that into some of the other things that hopefully they'll be able to do when they get more skill inside the huddle. You know, I've loved the run first mentality from fields, but my concern is, and a lot of other people feel the same way. How sustainable do you think this is at some point he's going to have to throw the ball more, right? Yeah, no doubt. Um, it can always be a part of what you're doing. I think, you know, last game, uh, I think Jalen Hurts ran it 16 times. Um, I think Justin is on pace to run it more than any other quarterback in the league. There's no doubt. And that number will come down. Um, yeah, it, it ha John, it has to. That you, you just can't. Like, he's a big, strong guy. I said this two weeks ago on the air. I said, you know, I think the league is – figuring out that he's bigger, stronger, and faster than they could have ever imagined. Because you watch film and you see defenders that are kind of closing in on him, thinking they're either going to catch him or bring him down, and he's gone. Or he just breaks an arm tackle. I mean, it's really – I think the league is, is – is, it takes a while for them to figure out what is happening. Um, but, yeah, you can't – I, I said a couple of weeks ago I was mentioning that he can still run the football, but the efficiency of the offense, when all of the scoring is surrounding his explosive ability and all that they're asking him to do, at some point in this league, you're going to get dinged up. You know, whether it's a shoulder or it's a hamstring or you roll your ankle, whatever it is. Like we saw it last year. He got hurt a little bit last year. When he's not able to go 1,000 miles an hour, they're going to have to adjust things because he's not going to break all those arm tackles and he's not going to run away from everyone because you just can't physically be 100% and being asked to do what he's being asked to do over the course of 17 games. So my thought was even a couple of weeks ago was, hey, we've, okay, we've, we've learned this. We've implemented this. We're not going to the playoffs. So what we need to do now is on the final – you know, and, and, and this was barring him getting hurt the final four or five or six games of the season. Let's just forego the efficiency of the offense. We know if we're sitting back in the pocket, they're not going to score as many points because they're more dangerous when he's moving. But at the end of the day, you need that growth. You need that progress. And my, if I was Luke Getze, I'd be in the film room every day saying, look, Justin, we're going to adjust some things here now. We're going to throw the ball a little bit more, protect you, protect your legs and do some other things, try to see if we can get some growth in there and some progress on that end. And don't worry if you throw an interception or two. Because if you watch film of him now, and he's in the pocket, he's he's reluctant to throw it at times. He's not an anticipatory thrower, and he's, he's more of a see-it-throw-it guy, which you see a lot with young quarterbacks. Um, but now I would go into whenever he comes back, whenever he plays, don't worry about making mistakes in the passing game. Those are all learning experience, but I would focus on them throwing it more for the remaining part of the season for sure. Just, not just to protect him, but that's part of the process. That's part of the growth process as well. You know, so teams are going to, you know, teams made the adjustment. If you look at the Falcons film, they did a really nice job of, of, of trying to Dean Pease as an experienced defensive coordinator. And going forward, you're going to see some defenses that have a plan for it. So you're going to have to counter what they do to you. How good of a passer is Fields right now to you? I don't, I, you know, I said this on, on 
when was the last day I worked? Hell, Wednesday. I said, I think for me, for me, it's unfair to judge him as a passer in total until you get a situation where he's more adequately protected and there's a little more talent, a little more, there's significantly more talents on the fringe, on the edge. Because like there were three instances in that game, John, that, that just make you, you know, scratch your, your head. There were two sacks on called screen passes. Okay. Like you, that, that, I think that, that describes how porous the pass protection can be. And there was another situation where they had seven guys in, the Falcons rushed four and still sacked him in a matter of three, three clicks. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get a beat on it. I would say right now he's most comfortable on the move. Like he makes a few throws every game that just are there that wow you, I think the throw to Montgomery was on the, on the edge was, was really a great throw. Um, he, he's not overly accurate over the court right now. I mean, you look at his completion percentage, it's probably right at 60%. And a lot of that includes a lot of wide receiver bubble screens and, and screens, but that's okay. I mean, you know, he's under duress a lot and he's, he does, like I said, doesn't have a lot of a talent out on the edge at this point. I would say right now, you know, I would mediocre in terms of a passer, you know, nothing that I'm going to be all up in arms about. And, and again, as I said, Anyone who wants to define who he is at this point to me, or you're being premature, I, I don't think you know who he'll be as a passer until he's got better guys around him. I think Luke Getze, again, has done a brilliant job with, with the design of plays. In the red zone, they're a nightmare because to defend because Justin's a threat to run, and when he gets on the move, that's where he's comfortable and he's most accurate. The play design's been really good, too. Uh, he needs to work on his deep ball accuracy. I think we see that. I mean, I think he missed Darnell Mooney in the game against the Falcons. I don't think he's got a high completion percentage on a lot of that. Um, but if he can see it and, and he can throw it, I mean, he's got a, a ridiculously strong arm. I think these are all things that need to be refined, you know. So you want to make a long-term conclusion about what he is or who he is as a passer right now, have at it. I, I don't think it's fair to him until you know we see some improvement around him what kind of improvement do you want to see the bears do first and foremost you got to protect the pocket i mean you just have to you again i can describe to you you know you can't i don't care if he's a is a young quarterback listen if you if i said i i know trevor a little bit trevor's a great guy his his wife and my daughter were were college soccer players together at northwestern i, I have a lot of respect for trevor but i said all week if trevor plays I kept saying, say a prayer for Trevor, not because he's not a competent player, but that Jets defensive line is just dynamic. And if the Bears can't protect a mobile quarterback, they're not going to be able to prote protect a pocket passer. Uh, so I, for me up front, they got it. They got to secure the pocket. I, I think the kid Braxton Jones can play very good technique. He's just light in the ass, I think, as they would tell you in the offensive line jargon. You know, but he's coming out of a smaller school. You get him in the, in the weight room for, you know, full off season. Maybe you're getting bigger and stronger. Um, they got to secure in the interior of their offensive line. Tevin Jenkins can play when he's on the field. He's nasty. But I, I would say they definitely need another tackle. But that's where I would look. I, I think you have to you have to secure what you're doing up front first and foremost. And then you can work on the edge with, with receivers. But, uh, boy, that line's got to get better. What do you think about their receiving core now? I mean, the Claypool trade made them a little bit better, but do you still foresee more moves to be made? I have to. Uh, you have to. I think, you know, I've said this all along, and people don't like to hear it because they immediately everything you say is interpreted as a, a criticism. I think Darnell's a, you know, he's a solid two. Doesn't mean he's a bad player. I think he's a really good player. I think of all the guys that I watch on film with them, He's got good speed. He's got good wiggle in his routes. He fought the ball a little bit last year. I don't see that as much this year. I think he's a good player. You can't rely on him because of his body size. You can't rely on him as a one, and he's not a one. So if you have him as your two plus or your you know two B or whatever you want to call, and Claypool begins to develop a little bit, shows you a little bit more. Now you got another solid guy and. You got to find one. I, I mean, you got to find a guy in the draft. I don't know that that guy's going to be available via free agency, but you, you know, they've got so much cap space and draft picks that 
Nobody thought that Tyreek Hill was going to be available. No one thought A.J. Brown was going to be available. Some teams have cap problems and then have to unload guys. That's when you have to have the ability financially and with the draft currency to be able to swoop in and get those guys. But they definitely need an upgrade there. Uh, Equinemius St. Brown is a fantastic blocker. I would have him on my roster, but he's, you know, he's a fifth, he's your fifth guy. Um, guys have tried. I mean, they, they're doing it, you know, it's not a lack of effort. There's just not a, a ton of talent out there. I will say I am a little bit, and, and I would never jump to any conclusions. Um, the clay pull thing, I was all for it. He's six foot four and 225 pounds and runs a four, four forty. It, it needs to show up a little bit more on film. And again, I it's, he's got, he's learning an offense and it'll take some time, but like you spent a second round pick on him, you know, you got to start seeing some dynamic stuff from him. And I, hopefully we will see some of that stuff in the remaining five or six games. Why do you think we haven't seen him or seen him much? I, uh, well, I, I think he was on the, I think a chart, I was doing the film and, and I think I saw him on the play on the field for 17 or 18 pass plays against the Falcons. Um, I don't think, John, they're really comfortable with him in the blocking aspect of their offense. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's new, it's new verbiage. So it takes a while to get acclimated. I mean, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not panicking in any way, shape or form. We live in this, you know, this microwave society where it wants everything right away. Same way everyone wanted Justin to run it 15 times in the first couple of weeks of the season. And now everyone's like, Whoa, what are you doing? You can't run it. I mean, like Jesus, people find it. Find <laughs> will you um but i i think it takes a while to learn the offense and they have you know they're it's really cool i said this the other day i like watching film of them offensively because their schemes are you understand it like i put and again i hate to to go back but i always i was watching film of the previous regime and i always said what i would say is i don't understand what they're trying to do but when you watch film of what these guys are doing 98% of the time or 95% of the time, I know what they're trying to do. And in the running game, there's a lot asked of these guys. Like Equinemia St. Brown is, is, is a huge part of their success in the running game, both with the quarterback and the backs, because he's, he's sealing defensive ends. He's just doing a lot of stuff. So I think it's, I don't think they're comfortable with him right now. And think about it. If you're trying to develop a young quarterback, and you've got a, a you know a receiver too. I don't think they're comfortable with Dallas Jones in terms of him having a full grasp of what is expected of him in the offense as well. So, like I wouldn't write him off either. Um, that one doesn't look great at the moment, but um, you know, give it time. You got to give it time. So I, I think it, it'll it'll take an adjustment. It'll take him being Claypool being you know more comfortable in the offense and and them being comfortable with him and. I just would like to see him get out on the edge and, and with his size and speed, there should be some moments where you just say, Hey, Chase, cornerbacks on you, just run a nine route, just go. And he should be able to physically, because he's bigger than most cornerbacks and fastest as the cornerbacks, there should be some separation. So I'm hoping to see some of that later in the year. What are you thinking about this weekend's matchup? Bears, Jets. Pray for Trevor. Um, if that's the case, no. I, look, I, I, I think that I think it's going to be a tough go. I don't. I'm not impressed with the Jets' offense. Um, how could you be? I think they had two total yards in the second half. I think they did the right thing because they're, you know, they're looking for a playoff spot, making a quarterback change. That that defense is vicious. Um, I think my hope would be if there's any question at all, just sit Justin. I mean, there's no reason. I've had a dozen shoulder separations and it's, you, you don't worry about, you don't worry about structural issue. Really. You just worry about pain management. Um, and really like if it's, if it's going to affect the way he throws or the way he protects himself, then, then wait for the green Bay game or wait till after the green Bay game, after the green Bay game, you get a buy. Um, maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, but I, I, I mean, I, I would be very cautious um, so I mean, I mean, I don't think it's going to be that entertaining of a game. I, I'm looking forward to, you know, look, I, I, I like Trevor as a backup quarterback. So if he's out there, I'm looking to see if this, this offense has got any juice in a different style. I'd be interested to see what Luke Getzey does to adapt a, an offense in a matter of a week to a pocket passer versus what they've done. So, I mean, these are all opportunities to learn from, 
from different situations, but I don't have a lot of high hopes about what's going to go on on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of the whole Zach Wilson situation? So he's benched. Mike White's coming in. Um, have yeah. you ever seen anything like that too when you played? Um, I, I don't recall seeing a guy that was so bad but wouldn't assume responsibility for his inept. <laughs> and I think, you know, I'm not around this, this this situation, so I'm just I'm making you know suppositions, but um, and assumptions. I I just don't. I think that think that that you could see the difference between how he's handled things and the way Justin has handled things, and. You know, when you're bad, you just you gotta own it. Especially if you're got to, you know, you go into that defensive film room or that locker room, and they're holding up their end of the bargain, and you guys are offensively just a disaster. You can't come out and say, you know, hey, when they ask you, do you, do you, you know, whatever they said to him, do you feel responsible for it? Do you 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 feel bad about it? And you you can no, not yet. of course you should. And I think you saw what Justin did the. You know, after the game, he went in and apologized to the defense and like, no, we're good. Don't worry about that. But I, I think that, you know, that's that's the sign of, of being a young leader. And I don't know that Zach Wilson has has learned that. I wasn't a Zach Wilson guy coming out anyway. I mean, I wouldn't give up on him. I mean, you can't. I thought it was the right decision. I think, you know, as it was described by many, you know, people are worried, well, if you bench him, you lose him. Well, if you don't bench him, you lose the other 52 guys potentially on a 6-14 and 14 that is looking to go to the postseason. So, um, you know, a little humility and a little bit of reset for the young quarterback isn't the worst thing in the world. So um, not surprised in the slightest that they made that decision to move on from him, at least for the time being. Tom Waddle still here on Sports Talk Chicago. Tom, a few more questions before we finish up. First off, I wanted to talk about your toughness. How did you sustain so many injuries when you played and still play at such a high level? Well, first of all, I was a very mediocre athlete, so if I was slowed down a little bit, it really didn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't look at myself as being over, overly tough. I, I, I loved playing the game is, is kind of what was at the core. I just, I wanted to play. I chose the, the school in college. You know, I went to, to Boston college cause I thought I could play not because I thought it was going to go to the NFL, but I loved playing football. So I thought there was an opportunity that I was going to get a chance to play early there. And I did, I played as a freshman, which is, you know, Look, I went to school to get an education as well, and I did. I got a finance degree from BC, but I, I was if I'm going to go and play, I'm going to play. Um, and when I got here and I finally kind of earned my spot, I, I want, I loved playing, so uh, I was willing to do whatever you asked me to do. I mean, it didn't make me a hero, it didn't make me a warrior, it didn't make me anything. But you know, if Harbaugh said, "Hey, look, I need you to sit down in between Benny Blades and Chris Spielman," like who was I to say no? You know, I would go sit down right in that little hole between Benny Blades and Chris Spielman, and odds are one of them would light me on fire after I the ball was thrown at me. But like that was that was cool. That was me living a dream. So I had no no complaints. You know, I was always joking that if I did have a God given ability, it was that I was really I didn't care if somebody hit me very hard. So um, you know, it's just again, I think that you can't play that game and not be tough. So I wasn't any tougher than anybody else. It just, I was caught more frequently because I couldn't get away from anyone. You, if you played football today, do you think you'd be better than you were before based on these new rules and all these safety measures? I think I would finally wear gloves because those <laughs> gloves are should be legal because they're such an advantage. I know I'm joking. I, um, my God, I never wore gloves because back in the day, the technology, the gloves we had were these Newman gloves. I'm sure you've seen them. They were black and they were gray. And if it was cold enough, the, the leather would freeze. So they really, they didn't do anything. So I wore them. But these, these gloves, holy mother of mercy, like those, it's almost impossible to drop a football with those gloves. Um, no, I think that anything that would have been beneficial to a receiver in terms of the rules in today's game would have been negated by the increased athletic ability of everyone across from me. Everyone's so much bigger, faster, and stronger. I mean, even think it, think it there was never a time really for us where we had, there was a receiver like Brandon Marshall, like six foot four and 230 pounds and could run like the wind. 
and and conversely, you know, you didn't have Brian Urlacher linebackers, like six foot four and 250 pounds and could run like the wind. So guys have gotten so much bigger and faster and stronger. It's, um, you know, I, I don't want to play in today's age. I played, I was fine playing back in the old days. <laughs> Which iteration of the NFL do you like more, yours or this one now? I like this one. I think it, you know, it highlights the, it highlights the athleticism and the great, you know, the, the great skill of everybody. Uh, there's a time and place for everything, you know, I mean, it's the evolution of the sport. And I, I would say about pretty much any sport, like some would tell you, I enjoy the NBA back in the old day. I don't know why, um, because the three point shot wasn't there and the athleticism wasn't highlighted. I like today's NBA more than the NBA of years gone by. And I feel the same way about the NFL. Um, you know, I don't think they're baby. I don't think they're overly babying people. I think what they should do, though, John, is give. I think like roughing the passer calls should be reviewable. I think that's what you should do. I don't think anybody wants to see a battle of backup quarterbacks on a Sunday. I just don't like. With all due respect to backup quarterbacks, <laughs> people want to see Tom Brady square off with Aaron Rodgers. You know, they don't want to see Ga Blaine Gabbert square off with Jordan Love. They just don't. <laughs> So I don't have a problem with them protecting the quarterbacks to a degree, you know, like everything, you know, let's be, let's, you know, I think you got to protect guys. And I think that they do. I think they go overboard at times and penalties like that should be reviewable. But I definitely think the game today is, is more exciting than it's ever been. And Tom, before we finish up today, last question, what's the funniest moment you've been a part of on Waddle and Sylvie? Well, wow. Funniest moment. We've been doing this now for 15 years. So, God, I, now you caught me. I don't know that I have a firm <laughs> answer that the funniest thing that has ever happened. Um, I don't know. That, and now, like I'm at, I'm, I'm never at a loss for words, but I am now. I would say, I would, uh, you know, flip the script on you and say the, maybe the most, and it's back in the news now is maybe the most recognized things that has ever happened is we're the reason why Barkley and Jordan don't speak anymore because it was an interview that we did with Charles Barkley, where he actually talked about, you know, Michael needing to hire other people other than his friends. That was that art, that interview went, went national was picked up by TMZ and everybody else. And it ended up being kind of the, the impetus for the relationship being non-existent. So that's not a funny one because I want out every <laughs> like, in the sports world. We all want great players and personalities. You know, we want to see the interaction of all of that. But I think I just, I, I took it at 180 degrees instead of the funniest thing is probably the least funny thing that we've ever done. But I'm not sure. It's interesting. I, I don't know. You know what? I, I Give me time to think about it, and I'll come back on your show at a later time and have a better answer for you. That sounds great. No, that sounds good. What uh, what was the aftermath of that Barkley and Jordan thing? Like, what, what no, happened no, afterwards? We were scared to death that, like, Charles was going to hate us because we've had such a great relationship with Charles. Charles is, quite frankly, and I've said this for a decade plus now, he's the nicest superstar you'll ever meet. Like, whether it's on the street, whether it's on the air, like, doesn't turn down autographs, doesn't he'll engage with you. Just a normal guy who's brilliant at what he did and what he does now. Uh, so we were most, and we've never had Michael on. Obviously, we all love Michael, and the, you know, greatest player in NBA history. We never had a relationship really with Michael. So we weren't worried that Michael wasn't going to pick up our phone <laughs> calls anyway. But we were concerned that Charles was, you know, we would have alienated Charles. And, and in typical Charles fashion, he was like, dude, you guys didn't do anything. You asked me a question and I answered. And he, you know, his perspective was, you know, if somebody, that's he said, that's my job. That's who I am. That's what I do. I'm not going to lie. He wasn't disrespectful. He was just very, very honest. And, and I think, you know, obviously, again, from the outside looking in, it didn't sit well with Michael. So, yeah, like we... I don't know if we feel guilty because we that wasn't we weren't 
this wasn't like a radio hit job. We were like, okay, we sat in a meeting beforehand. We go, what can we ask Charles is a question about where he's going to say something and we can make national news? That had nothing to do with it. We just were asking a question, you know, as great as Michael was, maybe the greatest team player in all of professional sports. Why can't, why, why wasn't he having success as an owner or general manager? And Charles basically said, because he's hiring all his friends. He needs to go out and quit hiring his friends and hiring other people. So, like, it was a legitimate question that wasn't asked with any angle to it. And then we didn't really think anything of it afterwards. He was like, yeah, Chuck was, you know, Charles was just being honest and gave us a good, honest answer. It wasn't being disrespectful or, or you know, overly critical. It was just telling you what he thought. And, and I think you can talk about your friends. And they were great friends at the time and, and be honest. So we never really thought anything about it. Next thing you know, ESPN.com wrote, you know, took the story and the quotes and it showed up everywhere. And we we're like, oh, shit, no. This is <laughs> it, oh, well. And it, it, you know, it turned into, you know, maybe the, the, the dissolution of the greatest sports relationship of all time. <laughs> so, like, yeah, we, I don't know. I feel a little bad about it, but. What are you going to do? There was no no negative intention. You know, you've been in this business long enough to know there are people that will ask questions just to get a got you moment. Like we don't we don't it, we weren't trying to do that. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like it came back. You know why it came back? Because Charles was on Tom Brady's podcast this week and Tom Brady asked him, he was like, is there anything about the media that, you know, being in the media that, that, you know, you have regrets or whatever about, and he told the story basically, or his, his thing was, you know, that's, that's one of the negative, you know, issues associated with being in the industry was, you know, that that relationship kind of doesn't exist anymore because of that. He didn't mention us. He just mentioned the thing. And then everyone went back and said, oh, yeah, the genesis of all this was an interview he did on ESPN 1000 with Waddle and Sylvie. And so now we get, you know, I'll get the occasional text or tweet from people like, guys, you ruined the greatest relationship in all the sports. And it's like, <laughs> wasn't our intention. So crazy. Well, Tom, crazy. Thank you so much for being here. Um, always a pleasure. Really appreciate the time. Looking forward, of course, to listening to Waddle and Silby every day on ESPN 1000. And, uh, looking forward to the next time we catch up as well. You got it. Happy holidays to you and yours, John. And next time I talk to you, I'll have some sort of funny story for you for sure. 